and week to week, uh, unless we're taking the midterm or the final or you're turning in your own project, um, this is what we're doing. The grind, as it were. Greatness is consistently doing things well. So if you get into your uh, Blackboard shell, um, you can see uh, if you go to our class in 202, you don't even have to follow along because I'm going to hand you the blank form here. Although don't turn that in on Tuesday, that would really weird me out. You can follow along if you want, I don't care. Um, but you go in and you notice, here's where it says historical thinking assignment number one. Now Tristan, number one, that's the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Don't do number two and turn it in for number one. Then you'd be Chris in another class. No, I'm just kidding. HA number two though, you said you worked on before HA one? I got HA two done and then I realized I did the wrong one so I turned around to HA one and turned it in. Won't kill you. It means actually you have less work to do next week, but you know, stay on track with where we're at. If you ever get lost, you can go to the handy back page of, or the schedule page of the syllabus and it'll tell you what to do that week. Also closely correspond with the things we're talking about. So if you know what we're doing, it should be pretty easy. When you uh, go to do this, there's first thing you gotta do is click on this uh, hyperlink, download it, it will bring you a Word document. All right, you open up that Word document when it finishes downloading, which Waldorf Internet might take us the rest of the class period. <laughs> coming someday. We're waiting. I will also attach this to an email that will show up in there. Ah, oh, there we go. It's going to open like four versions now. Then you got to click this enable editing button. Sound pretty straightforward, Truman? All right. Then what I want you to do is type right on this. All right. I got everyone's attention. Just type on it. Don't like take this and then create another essay. You make my life more miserable. And I'll be mad when I'm grading it. Who knows what will happen? No, I'm just kidding. But the goal is that like this will keep you on track. This uh, initially looks like one page of stuff you got to do. And as we walk through this today, I'm going to warn you that as I talk about this, your initial instinct might be to go, you're going to ask me to do what on a week to week basis? That seems like a lot of pieces and a lot of things. And then I'm going to say like college is hard. And like, you know, when you were in high school, I'm sure you're a Belmont funny high school. You ever had a teacher that goes like, just wait till you get to college, Tristan, it's going to be hard. Every high school teacher loves to beat kids with that, like a stick. Well, welcome to the hard part. The only thing that's different is that the professor's swearing and that's about it. Yeah. Well, welcome to this class. Got to get through the grind. Professors also have a lot more questions. I don't swear at you. I just swear a lot generally. My high school teachers were great. Some of them. I hated high school, but they were like generally supportive. When I went and gave that talk at Central, they all came. That was one of the weirdest experiences of my life. All of a sudden, I was teaching at them. It's, it's strange. Left blood and guts everywhere, though. I was just dunking on people that whole time. I was so ready. Give me the opportunity to make the most of it. All right, so what I have for you today that I want you to do, and this is going to count as your quiz uh, for uh, this week. Your quizzes, I've explained some of this to you, uh, and some of you have gotten this in the meetings. We'll always do them on Thursday. They'll look different sometimes. Sometimes they'll be turning in your uh, notes. Sometimes it'll be writing out paragraphs that are similar to the final exam or the midterm exam. Sometimes it'll be other stuff, which like today, I just want you to take notes on how this assignment works on the form you're going to use to do the assignment. Now, like, Shay, you don't need to write down what you're gonna actually put in as content on here. It'd be impossible to do while you're doing this. But maybe just thinking about those constituent parts. Does that make sense? It's like, you're gonna be taking some notes, you should put your name at the top. Otherwise, uh, this will uh, help you through there and hopefully we'll get you on the right track to uh, have something you can uh, appeal to when you go to uh, do your actual assignment. Uh, later, uh, probably this weekend, or uh, judging from the, my general experience in the past Tuesday morning before you come to class, or 3.37 a.m., I don't know. It will be uh, what it will be. So when you get a look at this, uh, the first thing we're going to see um, at the top, it says historical thinking assignment form number one, history 202, and then it says historical questions. Select one for uh, focus of the entire, and I underlined entire because that part's important. 
And in my experience, people will sometimes go like, well, I'm going to talk about one of these questions under one of these parts, and then I'll do another question under the other part, and then I'll do another question. One question. Don't get ahead of yourself, right? You just got to do one. You don't got to do all three, because you're going to develop expertise in one of these questions to share with the class as we get into it. What do we need? We need to get a Well, sorry. Yes, it's a fail class. It's over. <laughs> It's like the second week of class and I haven't thrown anybody out yet. People are getting soft. I'm just kidding. I mean, it's usually only twice, two, three times a semester. But, all right, so if you look at these, you got three different options. Why do I give you different options? These are going to be the three things we talk about in our lectures and discussions and everything else next week. What does it do before the start of class on Tuesday? So you show up with an idea of what we're doing. Because I don't think, probably right now, you might have some ideas about the first question. How did technological and management innovations change life for Americans during the Industrial Revolution? Maybe not, though. That's kind of the broad one. You could probably take some guesses. You could take some stabs at it. If I put you on the spot right now, Cade could like tell us some things. I know Chris would give me uh, a little bit about it. But generally speaking, my goal is that you're going to come in knowing something about this next week, because then you've developed your expertise and you can share that at least with some of the other people in the class. You can chip in when we're talking about it. And my expectation is that you'll do that, that you'll be prepared to do it. So shouldn't be that hard. This question you could talk about, like, if you're talking about technologies in the Industrial Revolution, this is where you get to talk about steam power. I don't know. The process for making steel. If you guys have ever seen the History Channel's Men Who Made America series, it came out several years ago. Now they've kind of like walked that back and started to like not have it so gendered and they talk about other things. But yeah, you can look at all these big heroes of American industry that people uh, talk about. What, when I say management, this also means things like Fordism, like the people credit Ford with the assembly line, although I think that's overselling it. Like there was forerunners to that, although he like brought it to big time. Um, you can also look at like, so, like Taylorism will be something else they talk about in the book, which is uh, like anybody like a big productivity person? Like anybody track their sleep? And they're like getting your move goal every day and like, you guys will figure this out about me. Like, you can check my Goodreads and see I read 102 books last year. I was on track for my reading goal, or like, who only 84% sleep last night. I'm gonna have a shitty day, or I need 17 more move, or I mean, like, there's more data probably out on the internet about me. Like, if somebody stole me, they could really steal my identity and build a robot. That's my goal. You'd even take my voice from these YouTube videos. It'd be fun. Anyway, all of that kind of stuff, this constant improvement that you can always be more efficient, that you can always be better with your time, that you can be the best you can be by just constantly focusing on and trying hard and trying harder, that kind of all goes back to Taylorism, at least kind of in America, this idea that he's going to try to maximize efficiency in American factories and in American work in different ways, and we'll talk about that in the textbook. So. That's one of the questions you could pick. And so doing that, you're going to be looking at how do technological and management innovations change? So you've got one of our skills there, right? It's pretty intentional because the goal is to take those skills we were just working on and your greatest assignment now transfer them somewhere else. You need to use change. Um, you're talking about people. So changing life means probably economically, socially, culturally. See again where our skills could help you build this analysis. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as we get going. So this is your first question. If you're like kind of a general business person or just picking a more generalized question, that's uh, maybe the one for you. Uh, second uh, question you can pick for next week is, how did uh, industrialization, no, that makes no sense. How did, just forget, if you're gonna do this, nobody's perfect even, especially me, because I love to type stuff really fast, especially when I'm making assignments. Just, I don't know, anyway. If you're gonna do this, even you on the video, right? The idea that how did Eugene Debs and George Pullman display historical agency during the Pullman strike? Okay, so we just gotta erase out. Gotta make a note. <sighs> Come on, Cade. Just right out the gate, stumble. That's why I can never do track. 
couldn't make it out of the blocks. That I'm real slow. I was in middle school, they called me slow mo tempo. <laughs> You want to hear my one football story? Yeah. I made one good tackle in my whole football career. This might be a two for one story because I only played football in seventh grade. Decided it wasn't for me. I was just going to get ready for basketball season. We're playing Oskaloosa High School, middle school, whatever. It's the last play of the game. We've shut them out. I'm on the kickoff team. We kick it off. The guy breaks loose. He's going to score. And in slow motion, I run over, tackle him on the sideline. Everybody goes nuts. Then I went to film the next day. My coach was like, you were in the wrong lane. I was like, fuck this. I'm never playing football. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Seventh grade, banner year for me. I also told my basketball coach he was full of shit during a timeout and then didn't get to play for two weeks. In my defense, he was a ninth grader, like assistant coach. His dad was the coach. And he didn't know shit. We all make mistakes. Eugene Debs one time ran for president while he was in jail for being a socialist. Well, he ran on the Socialist Party ticket. Socialism was thought about a little bit differently maybe in that time of American history. Ran for president from jail and got 120,000 votes as a third party candidate running as a socialist. He's also maybe the greatest labor organizer in early American history as unions are forming and we're gonna talk about that on Tuesday. Um, so he's kind of a person on one side of this. When we think about agency, that's our people's and group skills. So if you're choosing this question, it's pretty easy to pull out. Eugene Debs represents one side, the laborers in Pullman, Illinois. On the other side, we've got uh, our man, George Pullman, who uh, he owns the Pullman uh, company, and he's going to be uh, the person uh, that lowers wages in this workers' utopia he's tried to create, leading to maybe uh, the first major, major strike in American history besides the American Railroad's uh, strike. So both of them are gonna have roles in this, and it'd definitely be different if they weren't there. Both of them uh, show significant agency, and as we talk about this on Tuesday, we're gonna specifically focus on uh, their uh, kind of uh, take on things, the things they do in the situation that makes a difference, uh, as well as we can see our two different groups, one being kind of the company, um, or uh, kind of, for lack of a better term, the man, because um, he's gonna be supported by the federal government. On the other side, we're going to have uh, kind of these labor unions led by Eugene Debs. So you can look at that over the course of your assignment and bring that in uh, to talk about this uh, important moment in early American labor history. Third question, we're gonna talk about populists or populism. We're gonna talk about the Pythoness of Kansas, Mary Elizabeth Pease, one of the most badass women to ever walk the Midwest. Um, she was uh, a woman during the 1800s when people didn't like to listen to women talk about anything. You think about we're still 20 years away from women getting the ability to vote. And she's like giving all these stump speeches throughout the country. And let's just say she got a reputation as a fairly nasty woman because like, she wouldn't stay in her place. But she came to represent what uh, grows out of uh, a movement called the Farmers Alliance that is advocating for better conditions uh, for farmers uh, in terms of railway rates, in terms of banking, in terms of just general economic and political position for American farmers. And this is where we're gonna see the most viable third party in the history of the American political system. They're going to have people elected, not just uh, overwhelmingly to state legislatures throughout the Great Plains and the Midwest, but also to the federal legislature. They're gonna run a candidate for president. We're gonna look at that moment and kind of see maybe our political system in a little bit different way. And uh, as we see this, I want you to specifically focus on these political, economic, social, and cultural factors. Uh, if you're doing this, they put out a 10 point plan at what was called their Omaha Convention. Uh, that would be really easy to go like, ooh, that's an economic one. That's a political one. So like, pretty easy to roll through. You can also use the other uh, aspects as you work through these, but I do want you to be pulling your analysis in. And I think that's an important point for us to get. One of the things a lot of you like to do, some of you did this even though I cautioned you against it on your greatest time, you go, in my opinion, I know it's your opinion, Chloe. You're writing the paper. I also, generally speaking, want you to be creating, like I think there's a difference um, between summary and analysis. And one of the traps people fall into with this assignment, especially early, is they just try to summarize whatever they're reading somewhere else. And it's like, I know how to read, believe it or not. I can read the textbook, Truman. I have already. I don't need to, you to tell me everything that's in there. What I wanna see is that you can read the textbook or at least open it, right? 
and that you can then take the stuff you're using going, oh, that's a historical change. That's a political factor. Does that make sense? So like, that's how you're gonna move from kind of just regurgitating the stuff that's in there, that's in the textbook, that's in the other sources you're looking at, to actually creating your own unique analysis. Because I guarantee you, if I gave you all the same paragraph to read and then to write a paragraph about it, if you use those historical thinking skills, they would all look radically different. And it also give me a like opportunity as the person trying to assess you over the course of the next 14 and a half weeks. Oh, Gavin's got it down. Work through and go, all right, cool. This makes sense. So we got a question in mind? Pick one. Like right now, meditate on it, think through it, and then circle one on this sheet. I want you to have a clear idea. Cade goes, I'm not gonna choose till I look at the rest of the sources or see what's in the textbook. Yeah, I'm not saying you can't change your question later, but I want you to have one in your mind that you're thinking about as we go through it. So like try to try to make a choice. You can always walk it back until Tuesday. Because <coughs> the first thing you have to do every week is get one of these questions and then use it for the whole thing. All right, now we gotta talk about sources. Rub the remote, mm -hmm. no marker about that. This is my life right now. Is that 84% of sleep? They're all missing. What? Is that 84% of sleep? I'll kill you. Sleep is so important. You guys are in college, so some of you don't get it. If you can get good sleep, good system, your whole life will change. We gotta talk about sources. So one of the big goals, if you guys think back to the syllabus, we were talking through it on the first day to all of the uh, things on the front of the syllabus where it has all these goals, you know, I told you like the big things for the class we're gonna talk about. One of them, students will be able to critically uh, read and analyze primary and secondary historical sources. So first, we gotta understand what these types of sources are. What's a primary source? It's a first person account of something that happened. That's pretty good. You said who was there? That's a good way to think about it too. I think both of those, basically as historians, primary sources are what we use to really kind of like, I don't know, gather what was happening at a time. Now are there biases you have to sift out with people that were there? For sure. If you talk about like, uh, I don't know, I was thinking about this in the context of, if you called uh, like my high school girlfriend, and then you asked me about how that went, I bet our accounts would be a little bit different of what happened and why. Never mind, I can't say any of the words I was thinking in my head. <sighs> She's the worst. <laughs> Just kidding, she was great. <laughs> but this idea of as you think about primary sources, I want it to be something that happened in the time period at the very least. Now, a lot of them that you're gonna look at are going to be ones that are by people that were there. If you're talking about populism, you can look at any number of Mary Elizabeth Lee's speeches and pull that out. If you're talking about the Pullman strike, very easy to look at some of the things Eugene Deb said about that and pull some perspective out of that. Um, if you're looking at the industrialization question, maybe you're gonna focus on Taylorism, um, and then you would look at like something from Frederick Taylor. This isn't gonna be that hard, and we'll get there in a minute where you're gonna find these. Um, but we got a broader point because we gotta get back to tertiary sources. What's our secondary sources? This doesn't just mean the second source you're using on the assignment, which is where some people fuck it up. They just go like, well, I use this one source, now I'm gonna grab another primary source and put it right here, don't do that. I won't give you the credit for it, and I will judge you on the quality of sources you're using because that's my job, according to the syllabus. So scholarly secondary sources, I want to be of a higher quality. And in order to understand that, this has been a gap for students that I've been noticing in my assessment of these courses, is like you guys kind of just will take anything as a secondary source, going like, well, it creates some kind of analysis of the event. A lot of the sources that you guys will pull in for this are tertiary sources. I saw this in your greatest assignments the other day. Like, um, Anna, I'm picking on you here. You were talking about history.com at the end, right? So when I think about what I, I'd call that a tertiary source. And that's what I want you to use for this initial, where it says tertiary, and it literally says anything related to the topic. Um, it could be a video, it could be Google results. I don't care if you go to the Wikipedia page for the Pullman strike and then tell me about it. Because by goal, tertiary sources are meant for a general audience. So one of the things I want you to be thinking about with this is, 
in an academic setting, we gotta be going to that next level, right? There's a difference between like me talking at the bar with uh, the chain gang guys about Baldur football. They really care, right? They love you guys, they live for that shit. One of them, it says chains on his license plate. It's their MO. They got some weird takes on football sometimes. Different than when I go talk to, 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 when I go to talk to Coach Finley about it, right? He's gonna have some different insights. We want to be thinking about the expertise of who's creating the things that we're pulling into the analysis we're creating. So like one of the things I want to consider is who wrote it, who they were writing it for, and then the most important one, and this is just like, I think good beyond uh, this classroom, why you should listen to them. It's a thing people are really bad at because of social media. Everyone's got a microphone, and you're just like, ooh, you said something very stupid. I'm going to react to that. When you should go like, oh, I don't care what you think about this. This is how I ended up fighting a trash man from Rochester, Minnesota, about the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1890s. On the internet, correct? On the internet. Well, and then at the bar, too. But we didn't like actually get in a fist fight, because we came close. Can't be fighting a trash man over history. Professional. <laughs> ah. But this is one of the most important skills we're going to work on in here is this information literacy skill. Because I think this is a place where the world is struggling. I don't know. People read one thing and go, like, yes, that is true. We're like, how you actually develop research and understand things is triangulation. Or like as we call it in history, historiography. Like, you know how I know a lot about Iowa? I think I've read almost every single book that anybody's ever written about it. It's my goal. I've been slowly buying them. If I encounter a new one, I will read it immediately. And then I know what everybody said about everything, and I go like, ah, I think this take on Buxton, maybe not as good as this take, because pieces are missing. And one of the things is, is you try to build this. One of the reasons why I'm making you interact with these different sources every single week is I want you to be building up your knowledge base by looking at different things related to it. So the first step to that is how we all look up something we don't know about. We hit the Googler, or YouTube, or Wikipedia, or whatever it is. You know? Like, if all of a sudden you were like Pullman Strike and you go to start this uh, assignment, maybe that's the first thing Sonny's going to type into Google. That's cool. In this section, that's what I want you to do. Like, if you're a Forest City alumni and you spent a large part of your social studies education watching John Green's videos, you could just relive the glory days and go back and just go like, well, this is how I learned about history before. I'm going to watch his video on industrialization in America, and that's going to be the start. So in this, it's a little weirder, right? you got to put the site or wherever you get it from. A lot of times, if you just put the link in there, that's cool with me because I have the internet and I can also put the link in and then see what you're looking at. At the end of the day, that's what I care about. Historians use Chicago Turabian citations and outside of the two of you, the rest of you don't need to know that. So I'm not gonna make you. I care about being able to see where you're pulling the stuff from more than that you can go to citationmachine.net and type in the information and then copy and paste that shit into my form. That's a waste of your time and my time when all I care about is like, I went to YouTube and watched this video. Cool. Because the goal is that you'll put something there, you'll have an initial familiarity. Some of you learn in like radically different ways from others and then you're getting a video. So like, I'm talking about this now, you watch a video about it, then you kind of write 50 words about it. This said the Pullman strike happened because George Pullman was a jerk and he lowered wages while expecting everybody to pay the same rents. Cool. Once you get done with that, you're ready. Now we're gonna actually do some work. First thing is gonna be the textbook. Chris loves the textbook. He says the American Yop is the most exciting writing. I used to use the Jill Lepore book because I thought it was cool. Well, there's two things about Jill Lepore I thought was really cool. First, she's the first woman to write a survey textbook like for United States history courses like this. I want to empower different voices other than old white guys who, are, who typically have done history traditionally. Second, I think it's badass that she used to be a secretary at Harvard, like uh, Will Hunting used to be the janitor, except she was a real person. And she won the Secretary of the Year Award at Harvard. 
and she started crying when she was driving home and was looking at herself in the rearview mirror. She went, this is what my life's supposed to be? I'm going to be the best secretary? And then she's like, fuck that. And she went back to college, got a PhD. Yeah, sorry, Abby. It's going to be bad sometimes. I want to be a better person. I try to be Truman, just not. One time, I told my classes, this is like four years ago, I said, hey, the next time I swear, you guys can all just leave. And we did that for like four days. And then we just hadn't had class for four days. And it was untenable. I don't know. I need God to strike me down with a lightning bolt. <laughs> <laughs> Does someone bring a lightning bolt next time? Can we try that, Jamie? No. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe later. No, I don't know. We're going to talk about some ugly stuff in here. And aside from just my generally bad habits when it comes to precision of language, I don't know. So you got to go find the textbook. Where are you going to find the textbook? Pretty straightforward. If you go to this historical thinking assignment, here's a hyperlink to the text you're supposed to read. It's there in the document. So if you're in there typing on it, it makes it pretty easy. Just hit the control button, click on it, open it up. If that's too much, you could go to uh, Blackboard and go under Resources, which can be useful uh, to you anyway. And you will notice that two of them at the top, one says American Yop Site, one says American Yop PDF. So maybe you just want to download the PDF, maybe you want to print it off. That'd be a lot of pages. You can also just buy the book from Stanford University Press. It's available on Amazon, but like it's also free on the internet, so do whatever you want. Um, but if you click on this, it'll open up the American Yop site. You should be able to figure out what chapter we're in, where like here, we're in chapter 16, Capital and Labor, and we're going to go in there. And one of the things I like about the American Yop, this is like a Wikipedia on like super nerd steroids. So a lot of people like will give you anti-Wikipedia rants, and I think like Wikipedia is great. People go there all the time. Lots of people edit it because they care about the topics. Also, lots of people like me and my seventh grade friends that just like make fun of things and say like Aaron Rodgers owns the Chicago Bears, you know, and uh, put other things in there. Anybody can edit it, although it is really just one guy editing it. That was wild. I watched that video. You know, like one guy has made like 80% of the Wikipedia pages. Makes you trust it less, right? You're like, oh, I thought it was a lot of people who were worried about it. But on the bright side, you also have to prove your knowledge base to be able to edit it now. They verify people. Before that's true. Edit. And in the same way, big time verification for this. Stanford University Press makes this, and it's all historians with very specific expertise, because that's kind of how being a historian works. Like, if you want to know about 1800s Iowa from an environmental perspective, I'm that guy. Like, I know about it more than probably anybody on the planet and have the credentials and like work behind me to show that. The American Yacht then goes like, ooh, you could if you're talking about Midwest environmental history, they'll let me edit those sections, and also because I teach with it, because Ben is a person I know who organized the project originally. But this brings together like credentialed historians from all over the country and all over the world to create an open source textbook that's meant to be uh, a living document that's constantly changing and improving based on feedback people are getting by using it in the classroom. Um, students are uh, kind of uh, providing some of that feedback as well, and then people are constantly editing it to keep up with the field of history. So, like, I don't know that you could have a better textbook for this um, than uh, this. So if you go in, you'll notice there are pictures, which is great. You'll notice that uh, here, it's gonna let you roll through the chapter. Um, you can click on this, and let's say you're k and you pick the populist movement. Anybody else pick the populist movement? So if you're doing that, now, if you read every single word in the textbook, will that be better for you than not doing that? Yes. Are you gonna do that every time, Sonny? Definitely not. I'm not delusional, Shay. I know that, like, absent, we'll read every word in the textbook. I would have read every word in the textbook. It mattered to me. You probably should. You're like, it's so boring. Well, because you're going to teach high school social studies. That's probably different than, like, Jordan's going to teach elementary education. You don't really need every word in the textbook. You're like, I don't need it either. I know it all. You know I read every material you give us twice over. That is true. Yeah, you are That's so very meticulous know. about it. That's why it's good to pick on you about it then. You're not insecure about it, clearly. As we go into this, I don't know, if uh, all of a sudden you're working on the populist movement, if it were me, I'd probably go like, what does the textbook say about the populist movement? This is the next section I gotta do. 
ah, the populist movement. And then I would read that part, then go back to my assignment, and I would write about it. Now you need 100 words of analysis. Now again, I wanna reiterate that like, you don't gotta tell me exactly what the textbook says. If it becomes like the factual, like boiled down stat sheet of like the five paragraphs that are in there, probably not great. What I want you to do is to take the stuff that's in the textbook and pair it with this historical thinking skills. So like on our populist movement question, I'm talking about political, economic, social, and cultural factors. So maybe if you're gonna do that, you're gonna go, in the American Yacht, they talk about the social factors of uh, farmers coming together during the Grange movement to move towards uh, kind of advocating for better rights for farmers. Economically, they wanted the government to take over the railroads because the government had paid to build the railroads and they thought it was unfair that these companies then got to reap all the profits from a taxpayer-funded project. You see what I'm saying? Where you could go in instead of just reiterating what's already there because I don't think that's good for you, it's not good for me and it's not going to make you more successful down the road towards your exam, try to use those historical thinking skills. If you're doing one of the other questions, it might be more tricky, but should still be pretty easy to figure out what they're talking about, because if we go back up to the top and look at it, you go, ah, see, it doesn't say Pullman Strike in here. This is what I call the Brock Sobeck Memorial uh, method of reading the textbook. If you guys know Brock, you know he's trying to cut the corners. But, I mean, do really high quality work, but just, there's a big work, work smarter, not harder person. That's how I describe it. Brock was a big control F, uh, type in uh, Pullman, and then uh, go, oh, it says George Pullman in here four times. I guess maybe this would be useful. I would say if you only have one big paragraph on it, probably you're gonna wanna go up to the start of that section and see how like all these really smart people that wrote a textbook collaboratively, co collaboratively about this, decided to put it together. Does that make sense? It's like, I'm trying to be reasonable, but like, I don't have any delusional part of my brain that thinks all of you are gonna show up here on Tuesday going like, yes, I read it all. I fully understand populism in America. I can tell you why people call Donald Trump a populist, which actually I still don't get, so if you can explain it to me at the end of the assignment, that'd be cool. Um, maybe some of you are probably smarter than me. Not that smart, the Juco person, you know? Um, here's where it gets trickier, but not that tricky. You need a primary source next. Now, you can find primary sources all over the internet. Is that what you're gonna do, Chloe? Uh, probably not. No. Not that one book you made me buy, so I buy it on No, that's gonna be your secondary source. You're ahead of us, so you were logged off. Anyway, okay, where are you going to get your primary source? From the textbook. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sounds great. Because uh, you can make this harder on yourself or easier, like most things in life. If you go through and scroll all the way down to the bottom of the chapter, it's going to give you some information, like section 9, primary sources. And believe you me, they all tie in to what we're talking about because the people that put this together aren't morons. So like if you go in and you go like, all right, I'm trying to look at uh, the first question, you could talk about social Darwinism. That was part of how people started to think about survival of the fittest and putting that into capitalism in the United States. Still a pretty big concept of how our society functions today, the free market, the free hand, uh, invisible hand, all those things. Um, you could also look at like gospel of wealth or uh, any of these other ones. You could go through, um, if you're doing the populist question, it might be harder. You might have to like do some critical thinking. I know that sounds crazy to ask you to do in college, but you might look at just the Omaha platform, the People's Party, which I already mentioned to you, and go like, ooh, here's a primary source. And if you click on it, it's gonna open and it will read it out to you. And you can go through and I promise you, you could just like rip out of these. Uh, oh, okay. Well, it says, we demand free and unlimited coinage of silver and gold, the present legal ratio of 16 to one. Sounds like a political economic factor, and that's what the question is based on, because they want the government to take America off the gold system, move us to a mixed system, because they just discovered this thing called the Comstock load in Nevada. Silver is really cheap right then. Farmers were like, ooh, I have a lot of debt. If inflation skyrockets, my debts will be worth less money, and then I'll be able to pay them off. That's what I'm hoping happens to my student loans, right? Or Uncle Joey B comes through, but probably won't. I don't believe the Biden administration is getting anything done. Having yet. Could though. People surprise me sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of paper going on and off the press. That's true. <sighs> so many rules. You guys will figure out that I hate both the political parties. Well, I hate the people root for politics, like sports teams. <laughs> but they're like, I don't care who's playing. If Dennis Rodman's on my team, good person. If he's on the other team, bad person. Like, I hated Dennis Rodman when he was on the Pistons. But we got him on the Bulls, now I have like six Dennis Rodman t-shirts. Timeless. I don't even know who I want to run for president. I know I don't want to see a Trump-Clinton rerun. <coughs> We demand a graduated income tax. We demand the amount of circulating medium to be speedily increased to not less than 50% per capita. All of these are economic political things here where it'd be easy to pull them out and then write about them in relationship to your question. Does that make sense? I mean, like, that's the goal. Yes, Lisa. Okay, so, like, not related to this topic, but, like, say if you were to be talking about, like, the Constitution, would the Constitution be a primary source? Would, like, written law be a primary source? Certainly. Okay. Especially if it was written at or before the time period. So like, because like if you then all of a sudden, I mean, you could run into it where you could retroactively, I don't know, that could create problems for you. But um, that would be fine. Legal documents are great for this. Newspapers are great for this. More on like your HAs and the other class where it's like, ooh, newspapers.com or Iowa Historical Newspaper Database or my baby, the Forest City Newspaper Database. You guys seen this? It'll blow your mind. You can look up everything that ever happened to your family since they ever moved here. I found out my grandparents visited for one day in 1989. I was a year old, I didn't know that. Said they had a nice time in the newspaper. Cause that's what Forest City used to report on in the newspaper. It's crazy. It's all there at your fingertips, but story for another time. So you're gonna take a primary source, you're gonna do this. Maybe you're gonna look through them in the textbook and you go back in and you're still muddling through it and you go, Lucy Par Parsons on women and revolutionary socialism. Dispatch from Mississippi Colored Farmers Alliance, the tournament of today, Lawrence Tex. Oh no, I'm doing the Pullman strike. None of those really have anything to do with that. Everybody's like, all right, I was gonna do that question, I'm out. What's the next line of defense? You think about, all right, so if you go back to this resources page in Blackboard and you scroll down, National Archives Primary Sources, believe you, there are primary sources there. If you click on that, you open it up, It'll bring you to this link, and then you could just like search the government archives of the United States. You're like, ooh, I really wanted to find out about whatever this was. Nothing. I don't even know what that was. It looks like. So if you went into this, then you're all of a sudden looking, going like, ooh, here's some different stuff, and you again have to like show some informational literacy, and go like. Presidential Proclamation, Pullman National Monument, probably not what you need for this. If you were gonna do this, one of the other ways you could do this that would be easier than just going Pullman would probably to be like, type in Eugene Debs, and then, oh, Letters of Eugene Debs. And you click on it, and you open it, and it's gonna give you a bio of him, and then give you uh, op, uh, like uh, the ability to search through different records related to Eugene Debs. You can also see I've got uh, this American Memory Project as uh, primary sources, um, the uh, Library of Congress primary source sets. We've got um, just a few different options in here that could give you uh, alternatives. You can also just go to Google and type in Eugene Debs speech and pull that out and use that. Make sense? I know I'm beating a dead horse, but some of you are gonna do this wrong for like 14 more weeks and my brain's gonna explode. It'll happen. I've done this many times. Some of you are just like, yeah, I'm not even paying attention now. Like, ah, shit. It's the most important thing we're gonna talk about all semester. <coughs> Here's where it gets trickier. Secondary, scholarly source. This is where I really want you to be thinking about who wrote it, why they wrote it, who they wrote it for, and why you should listen to them. Four pretty easy questions. But I can tell you that like, the easiest way to do this is how in high school you were forced to do this many times probably. Go to EBSCO host or Jordan, what did you ask me the other day? Mm -hmm. About academic search databases. Eric? Yeah, all right. You go to Eric and use that. You could use JSTOR, you could use Google Scholar probably would be very useful for this. That's just you type Google Scholar into Google, it'll take you to google.scholar.com. 
and then it'll be all right. You gotta find something else to bring in. Now there are resources under resources tab on Blackboard that would fit this purpose, but these should be for a more academic audience. That's the big thing here is if it's for just anybody, which like this is where like History Channel moves into that other category. Things that are like retrospectives in newspapers that are writing about history go into it because it's not that like people in journalism are not creating quality analysis of historical events. But like I can tell you the other day I was talking to Austin Wu, who's a writer at the Iowa City Press Citizen, and he's writing a newspaper story right now about public lands in Iowa over time. And there's a reason why we talked on the phone for two hours is because he's using my expertise to build his story. You can cut him out as the middleman and go read actual academic quality sources because there's like this process called peer review and publishing that uh, is important to an academic career. And let me tell you, peer review is terrifying. You've heard this speech once already this week, but. Yeah, that's true. You go through it again in methods this semester. But like, you think about it, like, cause I'm not that smart. You know, I just work hard and like been doing the same things for a long time. And you go and you write something for an academic journal and then they send it off to three people that are way smarter than you. That's the whole MO. And those people probably are mad that they're doing this for free and annoyed that it's another thing they have to do in their day to day life to continue to maintain tenure or whatever it is. And they also want to squish you like a bug because there's like competition. Like everybody wants to be the best at what they do. And like academics spent a lot of time developing that. So they're going to go like, ooh, I'm going to rip this apart. And then you get it back. And the whole time in between, you're like, oh no, my career's over. I'm a fraud. They figured it out finally. And then it comes back and they're like, that was great. And you're like, yeah. That's been my experience so far though. But someday, somebody will rip my shit apart probably. That's why peer review is great. Because then, after I get something back from peer review and they go like, hey, I really liked what you put together there, but maybe address this issue. And then it saves me from like all the hate email I'm gonna get from the eight people that read my work when it comes out in a journal that very few people read. They'll be like, you're dumb and don't know my middle initial. Sorry, lady. That is an email I got one time. She wrote me five paragraphs on how I was a trash historian because I got her middle initial wrong. I went like, I feel like your ego's too big, lady. I just emailed her back and said, thanks for the feedback. I will make sure to correct that error in any future publications. <laughs> Press enter. I'm gonna get fired when people watch these YouTube videos. I got tenure, they can't fire me. They could find it. Anyway, these scholarly secondary sources, I just want you thinking about quality and that it's for a more academic audience. So like another easy way to deal with this is to go to the Waldorf Online Library, which you all have access to if you're on campus. If you go to the high school, you guys have access to better resources than our students because you're a public non-for-profit institution. So you have better access to like JSTOR. That's why I still use my Iowa State credentials to log in. I'm just waiting for them to evaporate though. So my research is gonna suffer. But find something of higher academic quality, pull it into your research, write about it in this one. This is where you do something different. You use the Jill Lepore textbook. Because I used to have the book for this class by Jill Lepore who we talked about earlier. And you can just use that for your source every single time on this. Other people own it, it's around. You could also probably find like any general survey of American history and there's millions of books like that and use it for this. I don't know, you'll figure it out. Again, just play with it. And most like points you're gonna lose for like a really crappy source is gonna be like a few out of 40 and you'll get better at it over time or some of you will just eventually decide like, I'm gonna take the four point deduction and go Khan Academy every week and it will just make make me so sad. We've reached a stalemate. Does that make sense? I don't know, some of you are just looking at me like, I don't know. I told you guys, it's gonna seem like a lot of parts, but once you do it once, by Tuesday, it'll seem easier, is that true, Sonny? And then by like three weeks from now, you'd be like, oh yeah, I can start this at like 11, 13 a.m. And then you'll screw that one up, but. It's doable. Then you get to the bottom. This is your time to shine. 
You've looked at what all these other people have to say about it, now you bring it together. So I want you to connect it to uh, historical thinking skills. And then the other thing that I think is important is to connect it to the world of today. Because history isn't just the past, as it says on the door to my office, as paraphrase James Baldwin, history is not the past, it is the present. If we forget, we're literally criminals. He was talking specifically about like the history of lynching black people in the United States, but I think it applies more broadly too. We should know what's happened in the past. If we want to understand our current moment, and like you guys are the future, they keep telling me. So like I expect you to go out and make that, and I'd rather it wasn't a shitty one because I'm probably gonna be alive for at least like another 15 to 20 years. I'm gonna drop dead of a catastrophic heart attack because I just drink two pots of coffee a day. Maybe, I don't know. We'll find out. Life isn't meant to be permanent. Someone's really morbid. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a lot. I know. We're going to deal with some heavy <laughs> stuff in here, guys, whether it's joking or not. One of my friends used to produce the news, the evening news, and we got into a conversation one day, and he goes like, I don't understand how you've survived just reading about all of these horrible things human beings do all the time. He's like, because I've been working here producing the news for the last six months, and he goes like, I'm really going through it. It's like, I can't like see any hope in the world. And I was like, yeah, sometimes you do realize like the Japanese army like killed 100,000 people rolling through Nanking and raped every woman in the city. I feel like good stuff happens too. Or we're better, and I hope that doesn't happen anymore. Ah. We're gonna have some heavy lifting in here, but one of the things you gotta do is show up prepared. And as you go through this, one of the reasons why I do this and why I structure this stuff in the way that I do is, you're going to have a chance to come in next week knowing something about what we're gonna talk about. Because we're gonna talk about the Pullman strike and industrialization on Tuesday, we're gonna talk about the populist movement on Thursday of next week, and then you're gonna take a quiz about it. So when you show up, then all of a sudden, Natalie will have some things, and then when I make you very uncomfortable, you're gonna be like, so what'd you pick for a primary source? You're gonna go like, um, this, and here's what I said about it. I'll give you a chance to like talk to some other people about your assignment initially as well. Um, we're gonna tweak some of the ways we were doing that compared to last semester. Your guys, well, your class wasn't so bad except we had a bunch of vegetables. Your class, there was no way. We just couldn't do it, Kate. It wasn't gonna work. We had too many differences of opinions and just other things going. It's one of the more challenging courses I've ever taught is just running the 400 hurdles. Just, I'm gonna die, I'm out of gas. Oh, and there's another one. I don't know. Does this all make sense? Yes. Um, like, so for each source, would you like us to talk about each historical thinking skill, or just? No, that'd be way overkill. Because otherwise you'll just like, it says 100 words. Now, like, can you write more than 100 words? Yes. You can chase it as far as you want. I'll read it, that's part of my job. But you probably just need to use the ones that are in the question or like pull in a couple other ones if you're like hurting to get to that 100 words. 100 words are like five sentences, so it's not so bad. You got 500 total words to do here. Yeah, that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're talking through this and you're like, better clear my calendar for the weekend. It's not that bad. Top and bottom, it's 500 words. Yeah, stack them up and go like, oh, okay. And again, this first one, the whole key is to just do it and get through it one time to go like, here's what it took me. Because like every single thing you're ever gonna do in life is there's some level of fear and intimidation until you go out and give it a shot. And then sometimes you realize, oh wow, I underestimated that. But most of the time you go into it and you go like, oh, I'm capable of doing all sorts of things I didn't know I could do. And trust me, I've seen people that can barely read do this, let alone write. So, you probably can too. What other questions do we have about how this is gonna work? Did we all select a question? Who were in my first group? The industrialization question about Taylorism and technologies. Three, four, five, like gaming. Trying to decide what I wanna do here. Just remember. Who were in my second group? 
um, about uh, the Pullman strike. That's a good one. That's one of my favorite history stories. I don't know. Third group, big group, populism. Everybody wants to learn about that. They're like, and it's on Thursday. What are you doing, Chloe? Third one. Third one? Yeah, You're second. third also? Second? second? Pullman strike, yeah. Okay. So what I want to do now, who is my first group people again? Sorry. All right. What are you doing, third one? Yeah, of course. You're doing the third one? All right. My first group people, I want you to get together. I'm going to talk to you about what questions you have, or we're just going to talk through some of the parts and think about it. Second group people, I want you to get together over there, and I want like uh, you to give them some advice on like that this isn't that bad. Third group people, you have plenty of people that have done this before to go like, here's some general advice specifically on the HTA of like what will make it go easier. Actually, now Cade, I know you're gonna do this, I'm gonna steal you from my group and you're just gonna talk to them for group one. Because I want you to just be talking about advice and I want you guys to ask other questions you might have specifically about the assignment that you're not gonna ask me in front of everybody else, that you're gonna email me at 3.37 a.m. Tuesday morning, go like, hey, I finally decided that I was stressed up enough, uh, enough about this to start working on it. And I'll be like, man, I'm trying to sleep. I'm just kidding. I shut my phone off at night. Keep it in another room. My house turns down. So. Send me a pass through vision. Does this make sense? We know where we're going? Group one, group two, group three. I want you to keep it because Maybe you took some notes that are going to help you do this assignment, and if I have it until Tuesday when your assignment's due. Yeah, I'm just gonna give you the quiz points if you're here. But I didn't want to tell you that, because like then some of you would have just like not written anything down, which maybe you didn't, but hopefully you did. Does that make sense? 